Hello. In the last lesson, we talked about the Landauer principle and reversible logic elements. In addition, at the end of the lesson, using the example of half adder and full adder, we showed that any calculation circuit can be composed only of reversible universal logic elements, such as C node and CC node. Naturally, there are other logic elements, but the fact that we have already managed to consider will be quite enough to make the necessary analogs with quantum computing. However, before we start talking about quantum logic elements, it will be useful for us to recall the Pauli matrices introduced earlier and look at their properties. So, as we know, the Pauli matrices are the set of three Hermitian 2 times 2 matrices. On the slide that you see, these matrices are denoted as, with sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, and their explicit form is written out. Recall that the Pauli matrices form the basis of all Hermitian 2 times 2 matrices with zero trace. And if we add an identity matrix to the Pauli matrix, uh, then they form a basis for any 2 times 2 Hermitian matrices. In other words, any 2 times 2 Hermitian matrices uh, can be represented as a linear combination of Pauli matrices. We recall that Pauli matrices are use, uh, used in physics to describe particles with spin one half, and now we will see how they are used in the theory of quantum computations to describe sim single qubit logical operations. Let's consider the algebraic properties of Pauli matrices. The first property, the square of an arbitrary Pauli matrix is equal to the identity matrix. This is easily verified using the explicit form of these matrices. The second property. For each Pauli matrix, the inverse matrix turned out to be identically equal to it. In fact, this is the consequence of the first property, since by definition the inverse, the inverse matrix to a certain matrix A is such a matrix that being multiplied by the matrix A will give the identity matrix. So, when one of the Pauli matrices acts as the matrix A, in order to obtain the identity matrix, we must simply multiply this Pauli matrix by itself, as follows from the first property. Recall that for some matrix there can be only one inverse matrix. Further, the Pauli matrices are Hermitian, that is, when taking a Hermitian conjugation from any of the Pauli matrices, we get the same Pauli matrix. And this property also follows from the explicit form of the Pauli matrices. Note that since the Pauli matrices are Hermitian, they can be used to describe physical observables, such as projectiles of the spin of an electron, proton, and other elementary particles. Finally, the third property and the fourth property. The trace of any Pauli matrix is zero and the determinant is minus one, which again follows from the explicit form and could be easily verified. In addition to the properties of each Pauli matrix, the commutation properties in the context of quantum uh, mechanics are also important. The first property. The Pauli matrices do not commute with each other in the, uh, and the product of two Pauli matrices one cannot simply change the order of the factors. The permutation for any two Pauli matrices could be expressed in terms of the third Pauli matrix multiplied by 2i and the Lavis-Civita symbol. Now we want to introduce the Lavis-Civita symbol that is also called anti-symmetric symbol. The Lavis-Civita symbol denotes as epsilon with three, three indices E J, K, and this symbol equals to 1 for I equals 1, J equals to 2, and K equals to 3. And also, Lavativity Lavativity symbol equals to 1 for all permutations of the set 1, 2, 3. Though it's 2, 3, 1, and 3, 1, 2. The Lavitude, the Lavitude symbol equals to minus 1 for E equals 3, J equals 2, and K equals 1, and all permutations of the set 3, 2, 
one it's two one three and one three two if any two of the three indices coincide with each other then epsilon i j k equals to zero for any values of i equals to j or j equals to k or k equals to i. The second permutation property. If two different Pauli matrices are given, their anti-commutator is zero. The third permutation property, the product of two arbitrary but different Pauli matrices result in the third Pauli matrix multiplied by the complex unit and the Lavoisier symbol. Thus, taking into account the fact that the square of any Pauli matrix is equal to the identity matrix, we can say that in the production of arbitrary Pauli matrices, we always get either the identity matrix or one of the Pauli matrices, and this follows for any number of factors. The last property ensures that any Hermitian matrix can be represented as a linear combination of Pauli matrices and the identity matrix. Uh, that is, uh, they are the basis for 2 times 2 Hermitian matrices. In addition, if we have some function of Pauli matrices, that its decomposition can also be represented as a linear combination of Pauli matrices, if, of course, such a decomposition is possible at all. In the next slide, we see the solutions of the spectral equation for the Pauli matrices, that is, their eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Note that the eigenvectors of the Pauli matrix sigma 3 are often called the standard or computational basis. The basis of the measuring device, as for example the Stern-Gerlach device, is often associated with these eigenvectors. We'll also often use the eigenvectors of the Pauli matrix sigma 1, which is also called the Hadamard basis. Note that the eigenvalues of the all power matrices are equals uh, to 1 and minus 1. Let us now, with the help of the power matrices, define the rotation operator as the angle phi around the axis, the direction of which is given by an arbitrary vector n of unit length. Such a, such a rotation will occur counterclockwise if viewed from the end of the vector n in the direction of its beginning. So, by definition, such an operator will be equal to the exponent of i phi multiplied by the scalar product of the vector n and the sigma vector, that is, the sum of the products of the Pauli matrices with the corresponding orders, E1, E2, or E3, of the Cartesian coordinate system. Recall that the orders E1, E2, and E3 define the directions of the x, y, and z axis. Thus, the rotation operator is equal to the difference of the unit matrix multiplied by the cosine phi and half and the scalar product of the sigma vector and the vector n multiplied by i sine phi and half. For example, for a rotation operator at an angle phi in half around the orth E3, we obtain the difference of the unit, ma unit matrix by the cosine phi in half and the Pauli matrix of sigma 3 by i sine phi in half, where i is the complex unit. On the last slide, the rotation operators are written in their explicit form. Note that in the case when phi is equal to pi, each of the rotational operation operators will be equal to the corresponding Pauli matrix. Thus, Pauli matrices can be considered as rotation operators for an angle, angle pi around corresponding axis, sigma, y, uh, sigma 1 around the x-axis, sigma 2 around the y-axis, and sigma 3 around the z-axis. That's all. Now we have everything to talk about quantum logic gates in the next lesson. Thank you for your attention.